Hello, sixth graders. It's Mrs. P here again with another math lesson. Yesterday, I gave you a video on the introduction of parallelograms. And we're using a new math series, so I'm going to show it to you again. We're using this ready classroom. And I told you we just have to give grace to each other. We have to be patient with each other because it's the first time we're using this new math series as a resource with our curriculum. But as I thought about it last night, Mrs. P decided, I'm going to give you a video on what I know about parallelograms. I'm then going to give you something to practice out of the Ready Classroom Math Book, and hopefully it goes smoother. I'm not going to stress and worry, nor do I want you to stress and worry, about all the things you have to write down in that math book. I want you to think about, can I hear how it works? Can I figure out what I can do with it? Can I figure out how to use it? So, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that today is September the 22nd, 2020. It's Tuesday. And we are working with Unit 1, Lessons 1, 2, and 3 that discuss parallelograms and how to find the area of those parallelograms. Parallelograms are in the family of geometry for mathematics, and that geometry is going to lead us into algebra. So what I'm going to do for you guys when I post your Google Classroom activity and assignment, I'm also going to post some notes I'd love for you to take down in your math folder that I sent home with you at the beginning of the school year. You're going to find some notes on the finding the area of a rectangle, and you're going to find some notes on finding the area of a parallelogram, and I would love for you just to take these notes down in your folder for Mrs. P, all right? That way you can always go back and recheck it and look at it again in case you need to review. So now, sixth graders, what happened at the beginning of this week or the beginning of the school year is we started discussing items about geometry. And we started that with a beautiful thing called a square and a rectangle. And we realized that a square and a rectangle, although both look very similar in shape and size, that this has a special name and this has a special name because of what Mrs. P calls their attributes. And attributes are like characteristics. So Mrs. P has brown hair, you might have blonde hair. Mrs. P wears contacts, you might wear glasses. And so sixth graders, every figure has different attributes. Some of the attributes might be the same as other shapes and some of the attributes might be different, such as we know that a square has sides. Well, so does a rectangle. But we know that the square has four equal sides. Well, a rectangle has equal sides, but it has two sets of equal sides. This side is equal to that, and this side is equal to that side. And so both figures have four sides. Both figures have equal sides, four here, two sets here. Both shapes are parallel, parallel, meaning the sides don't touch, the lengths don't touch. We know that we use an S to describe the side of a square, but we use L and W to, de to describe the sides of a rectangle with length and width. And this information is going to help us when we think about parallelograms. So I want to go back and revisit the things that we talked about. We know that a square and a rectangle have 90 degree angles. And we can actually find the perimeter and the area of these figures based on information that we see in their shape. We know that the perimeter is what goes around the figure and we call that the distance. Whatever distance you go around the shape is its perimeter. For area, we decided and discovered that area is what covers the inside. It's not really what goes inside the box, but it covers the box or the rectangle. That's called its surface. So area is what covers the inside, and that is also known as the surface. 
and we can find the perimeter and area for both of these figures using things that are going to lead us to geometry called formulas. We are going to use some formulas to figure out how we find the perimeter and area of these figures. Now, if you remember, when we want to find the perimeter of a square, we say we add the side plus the side plus the side plus the side. If we add up all four sides, that will tell us the distance around the square. This can also be written, sixth graders, as 4 times s. And when we get to sixth grade in algebra, if you notice, I didn't put a multiplication sign in there. Why did I not do that? Because multiplication looks like a letter. It looks like the letter X. And when we get to algebra, we might use X for something else besides multiplication. So anytime you have a number and a letter beside each other, it means you're multiplying them. Sometimes we even put a dot in between them so you know that you're multiplying them. But this is the formula for finding the perimeter of a square. If I want to find the perimeter of a rectangle, we say length plus the width plus the length plus the width because there's two sides that have length and there's two sides that have width. So we have to add them all together so we can go around the rectangle. I can also write this as 2L plus 2W because I have two lengths, so 2 times L will give me the same thing as 2 and 2. So if I said 2 plus 2, 2 plus 2, that's 4. Well, 2 times 2 still gives me 4. If W was 3, 3 plus 3 is 6. But 2 times 3 is 6 as well. So you can write this, meaning that, for the perimeter of a rectangle. So this is for perimeter. And this is for perimeter. And then we went on to find the area of a square. And we know we multiply two sides of a two-dimensional figure when we want to find area. So if I want to find the area, I just say take side times side. Again, we're not probably going to use that sign anymore. So to write this another way, I can say S squared. Because don't I have two S's that I'm multiplying against each other? And that exponent means take this base this many times and multiply it. So this would give you the same answer. And example, 5, we're going to say this side is 5. Well, if this side is 5, that side is 5. And 5 times 5 is 25. Well, S squared is S times S, which would give me back 25. So this is the same thing. These are the same formula. These are the same formula. Now I want to find the area for that rectangle. Well, I'm going to take length times width. And that length times width is the same as just putting L by W. I'm going to take two sides, and I'm going to multiply them. And that is the same thing. It's just a different way of writing it when we're thinking about geometry and algebra. Now you might ask yourself, how does this help me with a parallelogram, Mrs. Parsons? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to draw a parallelogram. In fact, I'm going to draw a parallelogram using your math book so that you have an example right here. So today our lesson is Lesson 1, Session 2. And it says that we're going to work on finding the area of a parallelogram. Yesterday in our lesson, we were just trying to figure out what a parallelogram was. So I'm going to go back over what a parallelogram is, and then we're going to find the area of it. But I'm going to use this example in your book, so I hope you follow along with me, and you'll write the same things down so it'll help you. And then by the end, I'll tell you what your homework is. So it says, find the area of a parallelogram. Read and try to solve this problem. It says, on a star map, so stars in the sky, Nina sees that four stars in the constellation, that's up in the sky, that in a constellation is a figure made up of stars. She sees that the stars in the constellation, I think that's Lyra, I'm not for certain that's how you pronounce it, 
appear to form a parallelogram. So she sees four stars in the sky, and those four stars form the shape of a parallelogram. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to make four stars, and I'm going to form them in the shape of a parallelogram, and they want to know what is the area of that parallelogram, and that's what we're going to talk about. And sixth graders, you can do this on a grid paper, or I don't even do it on a grid paper. I just draw it out. I'm not asking for perfection, sixth graders. I'm just asking for you to try to work the problem out so that you can understand how it works, okay? So she said she saw four stars in the night sky. One there, one there, one there, and one there. And hopefully that looks like a pretty, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I don't know, I don't wanna be too picky, but I want you to be able to see it. Ooh, make that screechy noise. I want you to be able to see it pretty well. So there's the parallelogram. She saw four stars in the sky, and they formed a parallelogram. Now let's talk about a parallelogram the way Mrs. P would talk to you normally without using that math book. A parallelogram. What I love for students to say to Mrs. P when they see a parallelogram is, oh my goodness, I think a parallelogram looks like something I know. And so we're going to talk about how that works. The first thing you're going to tell me is that in this parallelogram, you see four sides. That has four sides. That has four sides. That's called a square. That's called a rectangle. This has four sides. Oop, my marker's going to run out of ink. That has four sides, but it's called a parallelogram. Why is that called a parallelogram? Well, sixth graders, if you look at it, these lovely shapes up here had what are called right angles, 90 degree angles. Do you see a right angle in a parallelogram? In fact, what I see is an angle up here that looks smaller than 90 and an angle that looks larger than 90. How you find an angle is you start at one side or one edge of a figure and you go to the next connecting side where they join right here. So this side connects and joins this side. This is where I'm going to find my angle. This side right here connects with this side. So that's where I'm going to find my angle. And we talked the other day that this is called an acute angle because it's less than 90. And this is called, whoopsie, I about wrote it incorrectly. And this is called an obtuse angle because it's bigger than 90. So right away, this is why the parallelogram is different than a rectangle or a square. Because it doesn't have 90 degree angles in it right now. It has acute and obtuse angles. It does have four sides. It also has two sets of parallel sides. These lines are going to go on and on and on and never touch. These lines are going to go on and on and on and on and never touch. So it has parallel sides, four sides, but it doesn't have 90 degree angles. Not right now, anyway. When we look at it, though, I ask students, could you do something to the parallelogram that would make it look like a shape you know? And usually, every time I ask students that, they're like, yeah, Mrs. P, put your finger on that pointer and push it over to where it straightens itself up. And what that really means that we're doing, sixth graders, is we're trying to find where is the part of this rectangle that I can say, I have a formula where I can find its area and then be able to make it something into something that I already know. Well, sixth graders, a parallelogram does not have a length because it doesn't have that 90 degree angle. Instead, whatever it sets on, this bottom part of this parallelogram is known as its base. The parallelogram sets on a base. So now I have a base. And it doesn't matter to Mrs. P if you call that the base or you call that the base. Either way, it's the top and the bottom. Then we have to find some other piece that matches that base so that we can do the work with the parallelogram. Because a base, if you look, doesn't a base kind of look like it's in the same spot and it does the same job as a length of a rectangle? It does. A base really is the same thing as length in a rectangle, but it's called the base in the parallelogram. Well, now we need something called the width. Well, we see no widths here. Why? Because it's all tilted and it's all angled. 
For me to find the width, I have to have a nice straight line with a 90 degree angle. Well, Mrs. Parsons, you already said there's no 90 degree angles. But I wonder if we can do something to this parallelogram that will make a 90 degree angle. And so I want to talk to you about this is the base. This little thing right here where these things connect, and I'm running out of ink, where these things connect, this thing right here is called a vertice. It's where two lines intersect and touch, where two edges meet. It's called perpendicular, where they meet up. And if I can find one of those on our base, I can take a line from that area all the way up to the top, sixth graders, and that's going to make it look like I have a width in my parallelogram, and it's also going to create a 90 degree angle in my parallelogram. And if I can create a 90 degree angle in my parallelogram, that must mean I can do something to this parallelogram that it will turn into something else, that will allow me to do something else to it, that will remind me of something I've already done. So what you're really doing, and we talked about this the other day, is I'm taking that piece, and instead of trying to tilt it, I'm going to take it off. And I'm going to put it over here, because then, sixth graders, if I take it off and put it over here, then I've now created a rectangle. And I haven't got rid of this, even though I took it off over here, I just put it back on over here, the exact same amount. I took this off and put it over here. And the reason I can do that is because when I made that line that makes you think about width, it means I actually created a height on my parallelogram. Now I have a base and I have a height. And if I can have a base and a height on my parallelogram, I can remove it. I can take this off. I can re-add it on over here. And then look what I have now, sixth graders. I just have a rectangle now. I created a parallelogram, or I turned a parallelogram into the creation of a rectangle. And I can now find the area because the area of a parallelogram is the base times the height. I know the base. I know the height. Remember, I'm not going to use the X anymore. I might use a dot, or I might just say that area, oh, I won't use that there, that area is equal to base times height. So what you're really doing, sixth graders, is taking the information you know about a rectangle, you're applying it to the new object, the new figure called a parallelogram, by finding a, a dimension, its base, and its other dimension, its height, which once you turn it into a rectangle is exactly the same as the length times the width, and you're taking that parallelogram and you're forming a rectangle so that you can find its area. That is how it really works in geometry. Now, I'm going to erase this really quick, all of this. You might have taken these down as notes, and if you didn't, and I just said that, and you're like, I didn't take that down. Go ahead, go back and take it somewhere if you want. Rewind, and you can go back and find those and put them on for notes. I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to then, sixth graders, apply this to that problem in the book about Nina and her stars. So let me dry this off really quick. And let me put four stars back on, and I'm going to make it bigger so you can see. Here's a star. Draw it over. Here's a star. She said there were four of them. There's a star. I want to come out here. Let me make sure I can get these to connect. I might want to come out a little bit further. And there's a star. Okay, there's my parallelogram. Now, in the book, they're going to ask you, what is that area? There's only two ways you can find the area of a parallelogram, students. There's only two ways you can really find the area of any figure. You either can count what they used, or you can measure it and draw it out. So I'm going to do this counting one first. And if you look at Mrs. P's book, what I did is I just counted everything that Nina saw on the, the parallelogram with her stars in the sky. 
So I counted, and what I counted was that there were 10 boxes along this line. So I now know that Nina's base of her parallelogram is equal to 10. I then came back and I counted up. So I counted horizontally, and horizontally means going across. I then counted vertically, and vertically means counting up and down. And it was 10 boxes across and four boxes up. Because sixth graders, if I can find a height on this parallelogram, which I can, start at what is known as a vertice, go all the way up, does it create a 90 degree angle? This now is my height. Now either somebody has to tell me what that is, or I have to be able to measure it or count it to figure it out. And this height in here would be the same if it was the height out here. That line is as big as this line. And you can see why we have to do that. Six graders, I can't tell what that line is when it's angled, but I can measure this line straight up and down. So you've got to find a height when you're working with your parallelogram. Well, now I have one, and when I checked Nina's, it was four. So now I know the height right out here or in here is four. The, and I'll put it here. The height is equal to four. So now sixth graders, I really have everything I need in order to find the area of that parallelogram because we said area is equal to base times height. Do I know how big the base is in this parallelogram? I certainly do, it's 10. Do I know how tall this parallelogram is? I certainly do, it's four. So the base is 10, the height is four. My formula is area equals base times height, which is the same as 10 times four. So then I'm going to write my area is equal to 10, that's my base, times four, that's my height, and so my area is equal to 40. Now I can't just write 40. I have to use whatever measurement they used. And in this example, she didn't use a measurement. She doesn't tell me if it's feet or miles or inches. And whenever they do not use a measurement, you have to call it units. So we're gonna say it's 40 units. Uh, uh, uh. But we will not stop there because sixth graders, we know when you figure area, you must square it because that's what's telling us what covers your figure. So you can write 40 units square, or you can write that it is equal to 40 square units. 40 square units, and I'm cutting the shadow there. 40 square units. And that is how you find the area of a parallelogram. Now, I want to just take it a step further before I let you go and tell you how you see this as a rectangle. And I want to use a different color, so I, I'm going to just grab a different marker. One moment, sixth graders. I want you to be able to see how this parallelogram actually makes a rectangle. So earlier I said I found the height. So what I can really do is take this lovely little triangle off and I can put it over here. And now sixth graders, right here, I've now formed a rectangle. I took off this triangle off the end and I formed a rectangle with it over there. What I removed from here, I put right back over there. I didn't cut off any of the dimensions. This from here to here is 10. This from here to here is 10. Just because I cut this off and put it on over there doesn't mean I changed anything. It's still 10. I just took these pieces off and put them over there. And the height is still the same because I didn't shrink the parallelogram. I left its height the same. So now I formed it into a rectangle and a rectangle its formula is length times width because it's called a rectangle. Well, 
the area for a parallelogram is base times height. So my base is 10, my height is 4, 10 times 4 is 40 units, and it's got to be squared. And that, to me, is a better way for you to understand how you work with parallelograms. And then sixth graders, in the book, hopefully you are following along with me, that is what I did here. I wrote it out using numbers and words, and then I modeled it just like I modeled it here on the board. I took some pieces off, and I created a rectangle. Now, the back page, sixth graders, is just going to discuss that with you. It's going to say, hey, can you picture this? Can you model this? And it's going to give you some information to read over and talk about. They're then going to ask you to kind of analyze, and that means evaluate. It means to think about what you've just done and what you've listened to and what you've learned. So then page 11 and 12 is going to ask you some questions that they want you to try to answer from your learning. Then, sixth graders, page 13, I can't get it because my fingers are not working. Page 13 and 14 is going to ask you to actually do the homework and see if you can show Mrs. P how to find the area of a parallelogram. And that is it. That's the end of the lesson. I might actually finish under 30 minutes, we'll see. So this is your homework. And so what I'm going to do, sixth graders, if you remember, I'm gonna put up some notes in your presentation today. I'm gonna to put up this video, and I'm gonna put up what your homework is. And then you'll be able to send it to me right in Google Classroom. I don't know how well it worked yesterday, so I'm gonna try something different today for you, okay? So now I wanna just leave you with this information. Many a time students are gonna ask me, why am I doing that? And when I say that, I mean, why am I doing that math behind me? And I mentioned this to you the other day. Sixth graders, I literally do not know what you're gonna be in life. Maybe you're gonna be some kind of builder or an engineer or whatever it is. Mrs. P is not worried about you memorizing the formulas. What I'm more worried about is you understanding that it takes work to do math and that you're willing to do work to solve the math. That's really what math is about. Being able to understand something by the work you put into it and how you use it. That's mathematics. So although sometimes the homework seems like, Ugh, I gotta do work, that's the actual way that you learn and that's the way you show people that you know stuff and that you understand it. So, why are you finding the area of a parallelogram? Because someday you may put a, um, a, maybe a deck, a new deck on the back of your house, like where your mom and dad do barbecuing. <laughs> you might have to do that. You might build a doghouse with your dad. You need to know how to find this formula, or not find the formula. You need to know how to use what you think the formula is in your head to solve the problem. It's so that you can do real life things when you go out into the world. So, I hope I covered everything. This is only the second time I've recorded the video today. Hopefully it's all good now, sixth graders. Hopefully it, you understand it better than even yesterday's video. And if you don't, please remember, questions, 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 you must email. I'm not a mind reader. I won't be able to help you unless you ask me or you tell me, I need your help. But any questions? Let me know. I hope you had a marvelous Monday. I hope you have a terrific Tuesday. And I'll see you back here on Wacky Wednesday. Have a great Tuesday, sixth graders. I'll see you later.